If we listen to the marketing, we know that diamonds are forever. The ads tell us they're the ultimate symbol of love, the most perfect of stones formed in the Earth's core over millions of years. That kind of mystique has created a $50 billion industry. But Mother Nature may be losing her patent on diamonds. In a warehouse in Florida and another one near Boston, diamonds, real diamonds, are being made in labs. The technique still hasn't been perfected, but it's a big step. And what used to take thousands of years to create can now happen in a matter of days and at a fraction of the price. So this is your diamond factory. That's right. These are Carter Clark calls this 30,000 square foot factory in Sarasota, Florida, his own personal diamond mine. This is the only American mine that grows diamonds that are of a nature that can be used for jewelry. Grows them. Right. We this... grow them in this machine. Rough diamonds typically come out of the ground, formed over millions of years, more than 100 miles below the Earth's surface. Carter Clark's machines replicate what happens under the Earth, but they do it much quicker. In just three days, his machines produce a diamond. Not cubic zirconia, not cut glass, but real diamonds. The pressure that goes inside this machine is hydraulic pressure, and the carbon comes down and deposits atom by atom on the seed, and it grows and we end up with a diamond. But there's a hitch. They're yellow. That's because the nitrogen he needs to grow the stones quickly also adds color. But where most people just see yellow, businessmen like Clark see pure gold, because colored diamonds, more rare in nature than classic colorless ones, are more expensive. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. And fast on their way to becoming a girl's newest best friend. Today, everywhere you look, on the red carpet, in windows of the most exclusive jewelry stores, on the famous and the infamous, the gems everyone's dying for are colored diamonds. It's a trend Carter Clark is hoping to capitalize on by selling his man-made diamonds at about a quarter of the price of naturals. If you took the same quality of diamond as I have here, and if that were a natural diamond, that would be terrifically expensive. Like how much? A natural diamond of that size and of that color and that cut and that quality would be somewhere in the neighborhood of sixteen to twenty thousand dollars. Wow. We will be selling that somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty five hundred to four thousand dollars. I need some more stones to send out. Until recently, Clark knew nothing about diamonds. Oh, that's a beauty in it. A retired brigadier general and entrepreneur, he was looking for business opportunities in Russia when scientists showed him blueprints for something they developed for the Soviet space program. It was a diamond-making machine. Carter Clark bought one. Now, eight years later, he has 23 of them. We start with a little diamond seed. It looks like glitter. The glitter is a tiny piece of diamond. It's mixed with graphite and metal and placed inside the machine. You want to grab it? After only three days, a ceramic cube called the growth chamber is removed and cracked open. What's inside doesn't look like a diamond yet. The metal casing has to be dipped in an acid bath to reveal the stone inside. And then we cut and polish that, and look at that beautiful thing. That's that, what it looks like That's what it done. looks like after it's cut and polished. It's a beautiful stone. Isn't that gorgeous? It's a gorgeous color. Carter Clark hopes to produce traditional clear diamonds one day when he figures out how to speed up the process and get the cost down. But it could be years before he can do it. This is the laser cutting room. His and competition may be one step ahead of him. Scientist Bob Lanares runs a small, secretive startup company called Apollo, whose exact location we're not allowed to reveal. Lanares recently received a patent for his method of manufacturing diamonds using hydrogen and methane gas. You have 12, 12 of the 12, seeds in here. Correct, 12 seeds and those will each grow to be about two carat rough stones. And then they will be removed from the furnace and they will look like this. His plan is to create diamonds that can be used not only for jewelry, but also as semiconductors for computing. For now, he's producing a small number of very tiny, very pure, near colorless gemstones, which have been called too perfect to be natural. Is this improving on nature? It is because we can program the computer to make these more perfect in a batch of diamond. Everyone will be identical. What is the difference between this 
and a stone that was grown in the earth. There is no difference. The diamond is pure carbon, this is pure carbon, the natural diamond is pure carbon. All the same characteristics, all the same features, all the same chemical composition. So it's a diamond. I mean, a diamond is a diamond. It is a copy. It's a clone. It's not the real thing. As president of the International Gemological Institute, Jerry Ehrenwald sees a lot of the real thing. He says the man-made stones don't hold a candle to what nature creates. But they are real diamonds. They are real synthetic diamonds. They're cooked, they're, they're heated, they're put under pressure. They're made by man. When one considers a diamond, there's two points. There's the scientific end of it, and then there's the emotional end of it. Here, my darling, let us stay forever as a diamond will. The difference is, will a person be as happy with something that's made in a laboratory as opposed to something that took so long to come to us as a gift of nature? That's what the jewelers we talked with told us when we took Apollo and Gemesis stones on a test run through New York's famed Diamond District. It can sound like the real thing, it could look like the real thing, but there ain't nothing like the real thing. Like the real thing. And these are the real thing. It comes the real deal. More than 100 million diamonds are sold in the U.S. every year. And no one benefits from that more than De Beers, the London-based cartel that has monopolized the diamond trade for more than a century. De Beers says man-made diamonds aren't a threat, but they're investing millions of dollars to be able to detect them when they come out on the market, because lab-grown stones are virtually indistinguishable from those mined from the earth. So this is a Gemesis stone. Mm -hmm. To the naked eye, how does it look? Looks great. We asked David Weinstein at the International Gem Institute to test some man-made stones. The jeweler would take this and hold it next to the stone. And what's it supposed to do if it's real? And if it's real, it'll be. Since man-made diamonds are real diamonds, they pass that test with flying colors. But that's all the average retail jeweler is going to have. And with that tool alone, they won't be able to tell when a diamond is lab-grown. OK, so there's our diamond. That's why and the giants like at De Beers okay. have developed sophisticated equipment that detects man-made diamonds. Using ultraviolet light, the machine shows how long it took the diamond to grow, whether millions of years or just a couple of days. Well, this tells me conclusively that this is a synthetic diamond. But how many of these machines are out in the retail world? As far as I know, there's none in the retail world. So, so your average know. jeweler doesn't, doesn't have this? Doesn't have this at all. Right. Consumers really have no way of knowing. That's right. But Carter Clark isn't trying to fool anyone with his Gemesis stones. He's lasering the company name right on each diamond and is convinced that at a quarter of the price of a natural diamond, the demand for them will be huge. If you give a woman a choice between a two-carat Gemesis stone and a half or a one-carat natural diamond, which do you think she'll go for? Now, come on, what would you answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty simple answer. Bigger is better. Huh? I don't think there's any such thing as a diamond too big. <laughs> 60 Minutes 2 continues in a moment with Bill Geist and something he finds confusing about buying coffee.